Laura, we're here in Banff at the FQXI conference mm -hmm. on the physics of the observer, where we're trying to understand the role of observation and measurement in quantum mechanics, which is a long, uh, uh, multi-decade uh, controversy in terms of what quantum mechanics means. But here's my problem, uh, and, and you're the perfect person to answer it because you're a quantum cosmologist looking at what happens in the early universe, looking to quantum theory in, at the very beginning of the universe. So in that case, there were no observers. In fact, there were no observers for billions of years if observer means uh, sentient creatures or measurement or anything. Mm -hmm. So how can physics of the observer mean anything in the early universe? In order for us to describe a process at, at any stage in the evolution, whether it's before our universe came into existence, during or after, we, we implicitly have assumed that there is something observing that system, the existence of that system. And, and uh, the, by, by the same token, uh, in quantum cosmology, we are always assuming that there is a measurement uh, occurring on, on the system that we are studying and it's exactly that process that tells us what's happening to that system. It doesn't have to be um, something with consciousness, it doesn't have to be a human uh, being, it can be another system, an environment or a quantum fluctuation. So what's the difference then between an observer and just an interaction? That's a very good question. Uh, to, to have that interaction, we again, we have assumed that there is an observer and the system and, and the two are interacting. But you're calling it a, an observer as opposed to an interaction. So if you have two billiard balls, mm -hmm. I mean, to be really simple, and they interact, they hit each other, that's an interaction. I wouldn't call that an observation. When that interaction is described, it becomes an observation because the, the only way we, we can um, make an observation on, on a system that we are studying is by interacting with that system. Now, there is a condition on, on the uh, observer and that is that the interaction with the system should be very weak. Otherwise, the observer itself would interfere right. uh, with the act of measurement because it would change the system as it was trying to measure it. But the measurement process is a process of correlation or interaction. So what is happening then in the early universe? I understand now if we have mm -hmm. quantum uh, events occurring that we can measure in the laboratory or the, uh, the, the classical uh, um, two-slit experiment mm -hmm. that you see. I mean, those you can understand yeah. in terms of observation. But what is then the observation? It sounds like a metaphor as opposed mm -hmm. to something that is really imposed on the system in the early universe. In, in, for example, in, in the theory that I've been working on, uh, the, the way uh, one even induces the transition from a quantum universe to a classical universe is exactly through the act of measurement, through, through the coherence. And, and um, uh, in, in that theory, for so just to give you an example. A, a decoherence and why that's an act of measurement. So you have the, you have the wave fu uh, a function of the Schrodinger equation, which defines quantum mm -hmm. mechanics. And, and then to, to go to classical mechanics, that has to decohere from a probabilistic yeah. uh, space into a, a discrete one. That, that's correct. So uh, in, in quantum theory, we always talk of probabilities of something to, to occur. In, in classical physics, um, we, we have a very deterministic way of, of defining where an object is at any moment right. in, in time, what speed and what position, what location. And, and that occurrence is a, an observation or a measurement that uh, it, it causes induced, that to happen. That, that's exactly right. So, but, but also in quantum mechanics, we have this uncertainty principle. It's based on, on Heisenberg's uncertainty. So not only do we talk of probabilities, of, of events to, to happen, but all, all these events can be entangled with one another. So to decouple them, to separate them, especially if we are talking of uh, uh, universes, wave functions of the universe, to, to decouple all, all these wave functions from each other so that they become separate classical universes, uh, we, we need that act of measurement that, that will trigger that decoupling. That, that's what decoherence is. Okay, so and how does that happen in the mm -hmm. early universe? What is the, the thing that, that is measures. making a measurement or making an observation that's more than metaphor. It sounds like a nice metaphor, yeah. but it, it sounds like it's, it, it, how does it actually happen? Uh, well, many scientists will have their own favorite ideas and toy models, so they, they'll have their own ways of, of uh, identifying what, what the observer and what the measurement. What are some of them? Um, in, in my case, for example, in my theory, uh, the, the observer is very long wavelength fluctuations. So if we talk of this family of, of wave functions of the universe, 
universe. All of them trying to go from a tiny quantum object to a big classical universe to produce space-time. Uh, then, um, in order to decouple them from one another and enable them to become classical objects, uh, I consider the, the quantum fluctuations that are always present uh, of the wave function itself and of this uh, landscape of energies. Everything in quantum mechanics is fluctuating at, at all possible wavelengths, at all possible frequencies. If you look at very low frequencies, or, or equivalently very long wavelengths, then you are looking at fluctuations that are very weak. In other words, they will not disturb the system very much. And, and that's the condition that, that we need to promote that object into an observer. It, it's something that makes a measurement on, on the system, in our case the wave function of the universe, but such that it does not change, it does not alter the evolution of that system. So you, are, are you saying then that the uh, observer are the uh, quantum fluctuations that occur within that's the structure of the, uh, of the wave packet yeah. at that time? That, that, that's exactly what I'm saying, and, and not all the fluctuations, but uh, particularly the long wavelength fluctuations or the very low frequency fluctuations because we, we do have to impose that condition that uh, these observers, these fluctuations, are not interfering too much mm -hmm. with what mm -hmm. they are trying to measure. Mm -hmm. And, and so, in that early universe, with that kind of observer measurement, that's a, a lot of things going on at, the, at that time within this uh, 10 to the minus 43 yep. uh, area. I mean, it's that's, well, that's and, quite and a story. Yes, and, and it's an infinite number of them. I mean, we, we can have uh, Not only frequencies. Is it one, there's an infinite number of them. It's at the an same infinite time. number of them, so you can collectively think of them as a bath or an environment. And it is exactly this environment that is interacting with the system, which is the wave function of the universe, that is making a measurement onto that system. And that measurement induces the coherence or decoupling of all these possible wave functions from one another so that each one of those grows big to a classical. Universe. Does are you require for each one to grow big, or does it require w w could only one grow big? Uh, no, uh, many grow big. Not each one of them. It, uh, that depends on um, the amount of energy each of these wave functions will have. So what what the environment of fluctuations is doing is separating, decoupling all these wave functions from one another. And and once they set onto their evolution, uh, some of them will continue to grow and produce space time and become classical universes eventually. But some others will not have sufficient energies to, to make them grow and, and become classical universes. But just to be clear, this is your theory. Yes, yes. <laughs> and and if in someone else's theory, they will have a certain observer that they will identify, but which still has to uh, satisfy the condition that is not interfering too much with, with the system that's being measured. But, but, uh, but in, in that case, there may only be one universe in somebody else's theory, uh, because the one one of those would be picked out in this measurement that decoheres the probabilistic uh, wave function. That, that is possible, al although I, I can't think of an example now where that is done, and um, uh, the reason might be uh, conceptual. If we think of a one-universe world, then that it's hard to, to understand um, a universe that is not eternal, that, that had a beginning, because that begs the question, what was there before and what gave that beginning? And to answer that question, you, you are gradually being pushed to more than one universe or more structures beyond that, that one universe. Or so, to an answer beyond physics. So I, I can, exactly. <laughs> uh, I, I can see the question occurring um, uh, for an eternal and infinite sized universe, but it's mm. hard to see uh, how that can apply to a finite size universe that had a beginning or will have an and